Words at War. How far out now, navigator? About 80 miles off the shore of Umnak, sir. Uh huh. How's the gas? That's low. If you don't turn back soon, we won't get back. How about it, Bart? You seen anything? Not a thing, Lieutenant. If this blasted fog would clear, I could. Not much chance of that, son. If we ever flew on a clear day, I wouldn't know how to find our way home. Yeah. What climate? This year, come to the fog draped Aleutians for a soggy vacation. Hey, we better turn back soon. We're past that good old point of no return right now. Hey, wait a minute. Through that break in the fog. See it? Where? Holy cow. Jap ships. One, two, three, four, five ships and more. Say, that's an invasion fleet. Hey, let's get going, Lieutenant. We got some news for the boys back home. I wish we had a couple of bombs. Look out, here comes a zero. Five o'clock. <laughs> yeah, too close. You hit us, all right. I can just make that cloud bank before he can get back. Lieutenant, they got Eddie. Oh, bad? It's okay, Lieutenant. Just get back to base with that message. Don't worry about that, kid. It'll take a lot more than a zero to stop us now. Words at War. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime, brings you another in its series of radio treatments of important books of this war. Tonight, our book is Corey Ford's first-hand account of the war in the Aleutians, those fog-shrouded island stepping stones that Mr. Ford has so aptly termed the shortcut to Tokyo. And here is the story in Corey Ford's own words. History can turn on a very small hinge. On the 3rd of June, 1942, a Navy PBY patrol ship commanded by Lieutenant L.D. Campbell squatted part of an approaching Japanese task force and got word back to Dutch Harbor in Alaska. But the Japs that day were planning more than just the capture of Dutch Harbor. Make no mistake about that. They were planning the actual invasion of our Pacific Northwest coast. The Japs had planned well, and they meant business. But there was one thing they didn't know. Not until it was too late. I didn't know it myself, back there in Dutch Harbor, as I crouched in a shelter with an American bomber pilot named Wally Marvin. Jap high-level bombers, there were scores of them, were high above the base, dropping heavy explosives and incendiaries. That last one got the oil tanks. Look at that smoke. And those Japs sitting up there in the clouds... For the first time in my life, I wish I was a pursuit pilot. What good would that do you, Wally? There isn't a P-40 within a thousand miles of here. No? Don't bet any money on that. Keep your eye on those Jap planes. I see them. Tearing Dutch Harbor to pieces. Look at them. Circling for the kill. Ought to be any minute now. Yeah, look. Coming out of that bank of clouds up there behind them. Planes! Jumping! Jupiter, those look That's like... That's what they are, son. American pursuit planes. A whole mess of them. They stopped the bombing. Go after them, gang. Give them the works. Look, they got one. See that smoke from the engine? We're going to get them all. They're stunned. They don't know what hit them. Look at him come. Yeah, he's going to hit right near here. There's one that won't bomb again. They're running, Wally. They're getting out of here. Don't worry. They won't get back to their ship. They're licked and they know it. Yeah, but where'd those P-40s come from? There's no army base anywhere near here. Everybody knows that. Yeah, sure. That's what Japanese intelligence thought, too. It's a little surprise we had for them. Honorable Intelligence let those vulnerable flat tops of theirs walk right into a trap. Now, that's one time Honorable Intelligence was cockeyed. It was a victory, but I didn't realize how much of a victory until I stopped in at the radio shack. I found the operator sitting there listening with a broad grin on his face. Hi. Come on in. Hey, listen to this. I'm tuned into their wavelength. What, the Japs? Yeah. 
The ones we didn't shoot down. Listen, there's one of them. How come they're using their radio during an attack? Well, don't you know what happened? I just got the report. As soon as those Jap carriers found out we had a secret airfield here, they stampeded and ran. They just left all their planes hanging up there in the air. Listen to that guy now squealing, will you? What's he saying? I don't understand Japanese, mister, but I don't need an interpreter to understand that. Can't you just picture what he's saying? Whereabouts carry you, please? Gas very low. Only a few minutes gas. Fog very thick. Whereabouts carry you, please? Gasoline tank empty, please. No more gas. Let's come down and see. Whereabouts carry you? Matt? That was a Jap plopping into the sea. He's the 16th one I followed down. That ended the Jap dreams of an Alaskan conquest for the present. Their scattered task force put in at Kiska and Attu and settled down to consolidate. But our job had just begun. Now the long months of aerial slugging began. From their new bases all that fall, winter, and spring, our pilots bombed and strafed the enemy whenever the weather allowed. Whenever the weather allowed. That was the catch. In the Aleutians, you'll find the foulest, dirtiest flying conditions anywhere in the world. Let Wally Marvin tell you something about that, as he told me. It's the weather that's our real enemy up here. The fog and the wind and the cold. The fog hangs like a blanket over these islands. Day after day. Week after week. Believe me, I'd rather see a zero in the air than that zero, zero weather on the ground. But we have to fly just the same. We have to fly when even the birds are walking. Yes, Wally's right. Did you ever hear of a willow It's a wind. Cyclone would be a better word. They come up in a couple of seconds and they blow 80 miles an hour. When the planes are on the ground, they have to weight them down with oil drums. They even tie them to tractors. But it doesn't do much good. That willow hits, and they all get smashed. Now, with this weather around here, they practically have to use a 500-pound bomb for a windsock. Don't get the idea that the weather, bad as it was, was the only hazard those kids of ours had to face. Listen as Technical Sergeant L.O. Gardner tells you of a typical bombing mission, his baptism of fire. This was my first mission. I was pretty excited. We just left the field and I turned on my indicator switch, glancing at the panel to see that all bomb stations were lit. Everything was okay, so I slipped down my headset and called the pilot on the interphone. Bombardier to pilot. Lieutenant Mora. Go ahead, Gardner. I'd like permission to test my machine gun, sir. Go ahead. We'll be over the target in about 45 minutes. Yes, sir. Any further instructions? Yeah. There's a rock off the island just ahead. Let's make a run on it and drop one of our bombs to warm up, eh? Okay, sir. I'm ready. I opened the bomb bay doors and waited for the red light to go on so I could put the control lever in selective. The target came up. I toggled off one bomb and leaned forward so I could follow it down. I saw a brown, streamlined shape fall away from us and waddle down into the water just short of the target. Closing the bomb doors, I called the pilot. Bombardier to pilot. Mara, go ahead, Gardner. How'd we do? Just short of target. Everything okay, sir? Good. It won't be long now. Now that we were getting close, I began to check all of my instruments over and over. My heart was beating a little faster. I felt warm. I kept wondering whether or not I'd be afraid. Then, off in the distance, we could see Kiska Island, very obscured by mist. My left hand froze on the Bombay door control and my right hand on the gun. We flew in a large circle to the right. And suddenly, on the horizon, two ships. Pilot to crew. See them, boys? That's our target. 
My heart was pounding furiously and my breath was coming hard. We were going to run in low at mast height. I wondered about the ak ak At 30,000 feet, any aircraft doesn't worry you. But at 50 feet, your neighbor's little boy could knock us off with a BB gun. Our whole formation got ready for the run. Pilot to crew. Get set. This is it. Good luck and give them all you've got. Tail gunner to pilot. Good luck, boy, and Adam. Robert here to pilot. We're all set, Lieutenant. Let's get them. We began to nose down for our run. I opened the bomb doors and got ready. Varying our altitude from 15 to 50 feet. Dodging, bobbing, skidding, we closed in like a pack of hungry wolves. The ship, who was a destroyer, seemed to rush up to meet us. We were almost on our target. As the destroyer loomed in our faces, I called the pilot. Bombardier the pilot. Hold her steady. I toggled three times. Then, bombs away. Let's get out of here. We pulled up. We looked down and back at the ships. Our target was spotting huge sheets of flame and smoke. There was an explosion almost every ten seconds. The second ship was wallowing in a ground swell, sinking by the stern with black smoke pouring from her. I looked around at the rest of our formation. I could only count three other planes. Bombardier to tail gunner. Melvin. Go ahead, Gardner. Hey, Melvin. Did they get two of our planes? They got one. I saw it go down. Pilot to Bombardier. Never mind, Gardner. Good shooting. We got two Jap ships. Let's go home. No medals passed out for that raid. No pictures in the papers. No heroes made. Just a good day's work done. The mission was a success, so the boys buzzed the field before landing when they got home. But it didn't always work out that way. I remember one raid my friend Wally went on. I was in on the briefing of that one. You see, each morning after breakfast, the combat crews would gather in the alert hut to hear the day's mission briefed. They'd pile out of the mess hall, zipping up their fleece-lined leather flying suits and grope their way to the hut through the inky blackness of an Alaskan winter morning. Come on in the hut with us, Mr. Ford. Did you ever hear a mission briefed? No, this is my first one, Wally. For me, I've logged more hours in here than I have in the air. Oh, where the last one's in? Close the door, will you? Okay, boys. That's okay. the briefing officer. Okay, guys, shut up. Now, here's the dope on today, if and when. We're going to climb to about nine or 10,000 on the way out. We'll go north of the chain, come around the volcano to Pillar Rock, turn in towards the island, here on the map, and make a 90-degree diving turn. All flights javelin right. First element will use a 6,500 base altitude. Second element, 5,500. Start your bombing run about here. Now, the first element will take the hangar, the second, the sub-base. Use a loose formation except against fighter opposition, in which case we'll close up in regular tactics. Shipping in the harbor gets first priority, of course. Remember, on your bombing run, the co-pilot will maintain airspeed. The pilot flies the ship. Rendezvous, five miles north of this point, here. We'll have fighter coverage. In case a pea shooter gets in trouble, uh, you, Wally, lead it back to the base. Maintain radio silence on the way out. Standard frequency. Any questions? Uh, will we have much zero opposition? I think so, yes. How about any aircraft? Well, the official communique will state as usual, I hope, that there was no anti-aircraft fire. But uh, look out for those gremlins. Well, that's all, boys. Sink your watches. Okay, sir. We should hear about the weather sometime in the next hour. Okay. Well, that's about all for now. There isn't much to do now but wait. That was that. I shoved How about meeting some of the boys? Yeah, sure, I'd like to. Why couldn't we See that little guy over there working on the jigsaw puzzle? Yeah. That's Sammy, my bombardier. <laughs> He's quite a guy. Come on over. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Wally. 
Hey, this is the screwiest puzzle I ever seen. I'm thinking all along it's probably the picture of a beautiful dame, and now I find this here piece. Look, a cowbell. <laughs> Sammy, this is Corey Ford. He's a writer. Oh, glad I know you. Hello, Sammy. I thought you could tell him the story about your girl. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, uh... Well, that's kind of pathetic. <laughs> you see, Mr. Ford, Sammy's in love with a girl back in New York. As soon as he got his bombardier's wings, he got engaged to her, so he went downtown to buy her a ring. Sets me back 500 smackers, see? But when I tell a jeweler I'm a bombardier, he claps me on the back and he says, My boy, I'll knock off 100 bucks for every bomb you drop on Germany. <laughs> so that's swell. So what happens? So I get sent to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> That's tough luck, Sammy. Yeah, it shouldn't even happen to Hitler. Yeah. Hello? That's the weather report. If it's favorable, we go. Yeah, and I never find out whether this is a dame or a cow. Well? Yeah? Fine. It's on, boys. Get to your ships. Well, that's it. So long, Mr. Ford. Hey, we'll be back for supper. Hot. Come on, Sammy. Hey, hey, don't nobody touch that jigsaw. I'm going to finish it when I get back. Yeah. The kids yank their zippers shut, grab briefcases and charts, and pile through the door out onto the field, jostling and talking. The planes are already on the line, warmed up and ready to go. The crews pile in and they're off into the dark of the morning. I stand there at the door of the hut and watch them go. A queer feeling. It's sort of a catch in your throat as they disappear. It was a tough mission today. I stand on the field as they begin to come in, straggling. Usually, as I said, they buzz the field when they get back from a mission. But today, they come in quietly, plane by plane. I watch Wally's ship land and taxi to a halt. I turn to the sergeant who heads his ground crew. Doesn't look so good, does it, Sergeant? It doesn't look good at all, sir. Lieutenant Marvin's okay, though. I can see him in the cockpit. Look at the holes in that plane. Yeah. Here's your ship, Sergeant. Take over. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm afraid I didn't do the plane much good. No, sir, you sure didn't. There must be nearly a hundred holes in it. Hello, Wally. Oh, hello, Mr. Ford. How was it? Anybody hurt? Bombardier's dead. Sammy? Yeah, little Sammy. You won't have to worry about that engagement ring anymore. Yes, yeah, Sammy was dead. It was a bad mission, and none of the boys talked about it very much. You always get a reaction after a thing like that, even when you didn't go through it yourself. I felt sort of weak in the knees as I went back into the hut. I looked over at the table where Sammy's unfinished jigsaw puzzle lay. Another kid was sitting there laboriously piecing the thing together while he waited for his orders. I left the hut without saying anything. Do you ever stop to think what Christmas is like up there on a lonely battlefront, half a world away from home? We had a Christmas party up at the base. I'll never forget it. There aren't any trees on the Aleutians, you know, but you must have a tree for Christmas. So the boys went out behind the camp and gathered armloads of green tundra moss. They fastened it together with bailing wire in the shape of a small fur. Somebody sprinkled shavings from a bar of soap around for artificial snow. And for Christmas tree decorations, they hung some empty 50 caliber shells, salvaged from the floor of a bomber just back from a flight over Kiska. They even fashioned a star of Bethlehem from the top of the, for the top of the tree by folding a red cellophane gas mask cover. 
It was one of the nicest trees I ever saw. The long, narrow mess hall was crowded. The men sat on the tables and along the benches and on the floor with their shoulders propped against the muddy knees of the row behind them. Shaggy, unshaven, their rain-soaked park is dripping. Their soggy boots leaking little pools of black water under the rough boards. We were waiting for the festivities to begin. Some of the boys were talking about their favorite subject, home. You know, you think of funny things in a place like this. You know what I was just thinking? I bet my toothbrush back home is still hanging in the same old place beside the wash basin. I was thinking about my mom's fried chicken. Boy, you have never tasted fried chicken till you've tasted hers. If I was home right now, you know what we'd have for dinner? Oh, sure, fried chicken. But there'd be mashed potatoes and gravy, too, and hot biscuits. For dessert, maybe we'd have a peppermint candy stick ice cream. My mom makes it herself. And I'd probably have to turn the freezer for her. Well, that's a tough job. But I'd get to lick the plunger later. Well, I live in Texas. My ma would have a pecan pie for dessert. Man, no pie in the world can touch her pecan pie. That's the first thing I'm going to eat when I get back. No dinner, just, uh, just pecan pie. You know, what I'd like most is to see my wife, my son. I've never seen him. He was born right after I left for here. See, that reminds me, Mr. Ford... You could do me a favor if you would. Sure, Wally. What is it? Well, when we were back in Anchorage, I made a record for my son on one of those uh, recording machines in the music store there. You're going back to the States soon. Maybe you could take the record back to my wife. <laughs> I know she'd like to have it. And when the kid gets old enough, he... Uh... <laughs> well, you know. Sure, Wally, I know. I'll be glad to do it. Well, thanks a lot. All right, fellas, let's start the celebration. Celebration. It was the night before Kiske. <laughs> Christmas is a time for exchanging gifts. I'm sorry, fellas, but there just aren't any. The mail from home hasn't come yet. You all know how those things are. <laughs> Brother, do we know? <laughs> I wish I could put a package under the tree for each of you. But, well, I just can't. I did manage to dig up a few things over at the PX, though. Not much. Not enough to go round, of course. But it is better than nothing. That's why each man was handed a slip of paper when he came in. We're going to raffle off the presents we have. Watch your tickets. If you hear your number called, why, just sound off. Don't worry, what a boy, break. Look at my number, 13. How do you like that? Christmas and bingo all on the same day. <laughs> all right, fellas, here's the first number. It's 27. Hey, 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 that's me, 27. Good, good. Just step up for your prize. Well, come on, unwrap it. Here you are. Hey, what do you get, I wonder? I don't know, it isn't very big. I bet you one thing, I bet you it isn't a bottle of scotch. Hey, <laughs> you ain't kidding. Hey, say, that's great, Chaplin. Uh, thanks. Hey, fellas. A box of matches. <laughs> Here's a cigar. No. Here's the next winner. Let's see. It's number 145. Hey, I got it, sir. <laughs> look, Wally, it's your ground crew chief. Oh, the lucky bum. I wonder what he gets. Hey, chief, look at this. It's a bar of soap. It's not GI soap either. Here's another one. Number 13. 13. Who's number 13? Bingo. Oh, boy. <laughs> Here you are, sir. Here's your present. Thank you, Chaplin. Hey, what's your snack? What is it, Eddie? Hey, yeah, you give me a chance. Give me a chance. Let me see. You? Let me see. Oh, I should have known. That number 13. What do I get? An address book and no woman for a thousand miles. <laughs> hey, hey, I don't want names for me. All right, fellas. All right. All right. We still have a few more presents to give. But first, let's try a carol, shall we? Here's one we all know. Old little town of Bethlehem. Sing it out so we can all hear it. Let's go. One, two, three.
that was Christmas in the Aleutians. We didn't have any turkey or plum pudding because, you see, there were no boats. Our menu that day consisted of bean soup, lukewarm stewed tomatoes, boiled potatoes, which had been frozen and which no one ate, bread without any butter, and Vienna sausage. But I was eating it with our Air Force combat crews. I was sitting elbow to elbow with those men in leather flying suits who were fighting our unknown war. And it was the finest Christmas dinner I ever had in my life. The hardest thing to get used to when I got back to the States was the sun and the absence of the fog. The weather gets to be a part of life itself up there in the Aleutians. Yes, and of death, too. Got sort of a catch in my throat every time I saw a little boy sitting in the sunlight, because then I'd get to thinking about Wally, Wally and his son. I'd brought that record back with me as I'd promised, the one I'd picked up at the music store in Anchorage on my way home. I had to bring it to Wally's wife. I think about that record quite a lot and what Wally had said on it. I can hear it now. Well, son, you're growing up pretty fast. You'll be a big man soon. So I thought on your birthday today, we ought to have this little talk together. Yeah, there are a lot of things I want to tell you, boy. The record went on that uh, way for a little bit. Be a good boy. Wally told his son all the great uh, plans he had for you? him. You know the sort of thing. Uh, remember the things he said. I'll never forget the because... way it ended. Well, when you grow up, David, maybe you'll have a son of your own. And I hope he means as much to you as he'll mean to me. And I hope when you grow up, there won't be a war and you can be with your son instead of way off here in Alaska somewhere. Uh, I've never seen you, David. You were born after I came up here. But I hope I'll get to someday. Uh, be a good boy, son. Take care of Mama. Bye. 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 I never found out Bye. if the needle stuck that way when Wally's wife played it. I always hoped it didn't. Because, you see, it was goodbye. Wally wasn't coming back. I never knew just what happened to him, but his plane crashed into a mountain in the fog. That's all. Wally was a good pilot. There isn't a Jap pilot in the world that could outfight him or outfly him. But an enemy he couldn't fight beat him. The fog. Maybe it sounds trite to say that those kids didn't die in vain, Wally and Sammy and the others, but it's true just the same. They beat the Jap and they pushed him out of Attu and Kiska. The weather will be on our side now. We've built many strong new bases up there. And more men have come to fight that unknown war. Fresh-faced, clear-eyed kids who know their business. They're fortifying and preparing a chain of stepping stones that may become our shortcut to Tokyo. <laughs>